Welcome ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brian McLogan and in this video we are going to work on parametric equations. Now this is the sixth lesson in our chapter for applications of trigonometry and this is the exact same notes that I gave to my students inside of the classroom. So what we're going to cover for this section is discuss what exactly are parametric equations, how to eliminate the parameter, as well as how to use parametric equations to solve word problems, more specifically dealing with particle motion problems. But the way that I kind of framed parametric equations is I started off with a just a discussion as far as what the graph f of x equals sine of x produces. Like how would we describe the input and the output of the function based on the graph? So I kind of had this discussion with the students and, you know, most students just kind of did like a little general, like, yeah, the sine of X graph, you know, it gives you that wave function, right? But then I, you know, again, I wanted to understand, like, this is a function. We have an input and output. What are we plugging in? And what we're plugging in is the an angle, right? It's the sine of an angle. So we're plugging in an angle and what are we getting out? Now, a lot of students replied with the, you know, Y coordinate. And again, we had to press that a little bit as far as what do you mean the Y coordinate? Y coordinate of what? And then we kind of got to, well, it's the Y coordinate of the unit circle. And again, the reason why it's that Y coordinate, because it's really the Y coordinate over the hypotenuse, but on the unit circle, the hypotenuse is one, or the radius is one, I'm sorry. Um, so therefore, it, we just left it out as Y. But yeah, sine represents that Y coordinate, right? And that's basically what these values are. Like when we graph the sine of X function, the X axis represented the angles, and the Y values represented the Y values of the function. So therefore, then I said, all right, well, if sine represents Y, which most students kind of like feel familiar with, you know, what does cosine represent? And again, we think about them and say, oh, well, remember cosine represents the X coordinate. So a lot of students made this relationship of the graph, which you've already kind of did in my class, of making that relationship with the, you know, whatever the X coordinate is, or I'm sorry, whatever the, yeah, the angle, for the cosine of that angle is gonna produce the X coordinate. So when I went ahead and drew the cosine graph on the same axis here, you know, we had something like this. And again, not everything's going to be perfect here, but again, that would be the cosine of X. So that's cosine of X. And then remember the Y coordinate or the red was going to be sine of X. So that is going to be our sine of X function. All right, and again, remember sine of X, so angle, in, y value, out. And then for cosine of x, that was angle in, and that was x value, out. And again, that is from the, the x and y values on the unit circle, okay? Um, then I talked to them, I said, all right, well, what about, a, what about a graph that you could represent the x and the y values of that function, given the angle theta? So basically, both of these functions, um, are dependent on what the angle is, right? Whatever the angle is, that's gonna tell me what the Y value is for sine. And whatever the angle is for cosine is gonna tell you what the X value is. But is there a way I can represent both X and Y with like a, given that angle theta? And, you know, can we write a function? You know, can we write a function like this? Well, first of all, what we kind of brought into is if I said, you know, really here is, you know, whatever my angle is, here's the X and the Y. Can we write a function to represent this graph? And what this brought up to the students is no, we can't because these two functions, you know, they, they do, they don't pass the vertical line test. So we can't create a function to represent both of these at the same time for one angle theta. And again, it goes against the very definition of a function. You plug in an angle, you cannot get the X and the Y values out. Okay. So it's not gonna work in terms of functions to represent both of these, at least as one function. So I say, all right, well then, maybe can we maybe just create a graph or a curve, I should probably say. Can we sketch a curve, I'm gonna change that wording, that represents the x and the y values given ang every ang any angle of theta. So if we did that, let's just go ahead and say, all right, well, if we're gonna do a curve, let's do a curve on the x, y axis. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, all right, let's say at 30 degrees, um, what are my x and my y coordinates, right? So at 30 degrees, we have an x coordinate of square root of three over two, comma one half, all right? What about at 45 degrees? Well, at 45 degrees, we're at square root of two over two, comma square root of two over two. All right, what about at 60 degrees? 
Well, at 60 degrees, we're dealing with a x coordinate of 1 half comma square root of 3 over 2. And hopefully you kind of start to see what's going on here. At 0 degrees, I should have done this, um, that's going to be at 1 comma 0. At 90 degrees, we're dealing with 0 comma 1. And then you can start doing this a little bit quicker here because I think you start to see the pattern. At 120 degrees, I'm going to be dealing with negative 1 half comma square root of 3 over 2. Hmm. Square root of 3 over 2. At 135 degrees, I'm dealing with negative square root of 2 over 2, comma, square root of 2 over 2. And then at 150 degrees, I'm dealing with negative square root of 3 over 2, comma, 1 half. And the point that I'm trying to make is, oh, I'm sorry, last one, at negative 180, or at 180 degrees, I'm dealing with negative 1, 0. So when I deal with these different angles, What's happening is, yeah, what is this curve that I am creating, right? When I have an angle and I have an x and a y coordinate, what is this curve I'm creating? Well, of course, it's a circle. Now, a lot of people say, oh, it's a unit circle. And yes, for this case, we know what that, you know, those x and y's, like we did create the unit circle. These are all one unit away. But it doesn't have to be the unit circle. It's just creating a circle. Now, what is the equation that represents this graph? What is the equation that we have to represent a circle. And many students forgot this from the geometry class, but really we have x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. And again, um, where r in this case for unit circle, it's going to equal one. Like in this case, our equation is x squared plus y squared is equal to one. And that's true for all of them. And again, if you remember, that makes sense because when we looked at the unit circle, one thing, if you want to remember that, you know, this will come up later, cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta equals one, right? Because again, remember, it doesn't matter my x squared, my y squared, that's gonna be my x and my y coordinates, right? As far as they in a triangle. So the this leg plus that leg squared is always gonna give you one. So um, either way, the equation we're looking for is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. In this case, our r was one, that's why we have one here. But again, it brought us into that equation of a circle. Um, so the equation of a circle is, when we have a center at hk, it's going to be x minus h squared plus y minus k squared. So the center is going to be your hk. Um, and then if we have the center at the origin, we have x and y. And just remember that it's x squared plus y squared equals r squared, where r is going to be the radius. So one of the big common mistakes students will make is they'll see, you know, whatever that whatever it's equal to, and they say that whatever r squared is, they say that's the radius. But again, you got to make sure you take the square root of that value. All right, so. The problem though, and again, this makes sense. So here's a curve, but this isn't a function, right? This does not pass the vertical line test. So we created a curve based on the angle, all right, and the x and y distance, but again, we can't create a function or at least one single function. So then for, therefore, what can we do? And that is where our parametric equations come into play. So parametric equations are basically a way for us to take two different functions, continuous functions, um, on an interval and for a given input, which we call the parameter. So basically you can kind of think about these f of t is like the cosine of t and or cosine of theta and g of t representing the sine of theta. So in our case, um, t could also be theta. Those are kind of the two common parameters. Um, typically theta can represent the angle. T a lot of times for word problems is gonna equal represent time. But again, you can really use any variable to represent the parameter, but it's basically a way for us to use equations with three variables. Because up to this point, if we had three variables, we needed to have three equations. But we can use parametric equations, allow us to use two equations in regards to our one parameter, our one variable. So you can see how they're both inputs of the same um, variable or parameter, which in this case is t. Just make sure for your x and your y, um, for those functions, you have a continuous function um, or is going to your parametric equations, okay? So our two common cases that we're at least going to focus and for this class is understanding parametric equations for trig, trigonometry. So again, when we're doing trigonometry, um, our angle is, our parameter is going to be theta. That's gonna be the angle. And that's gonna produce us two different values for x and for y, which represents you know those x and y coordinates, not just on the unit circle, but really, um, for any um, for any circle or ellipse or any kind of shape. And then the second one that we're gonna deal with, it'd be like the, um, will be for a particle motion. 
where the parameter is going to be time. Because up to this point, you know, a lot of times in, you know, algebra two, we'll deal with particle motion problems, but either it's going to be some distance in regard to time, or it's gonna be distance with regard to distance. Meaning like, how is the horizontal distance relate to the vertical distance? Or how does the vertical distance, or yeah, vertical distance relate to time, right? But we never really talk about how are the horizontal and vertical distances with regard to the time. And that's kind of, you can see that we kind of have three unknowns there. So parametric equations allows us to answer a lot of those questions or figure out a lot of the information based on the horizontal, vertical, and the time. Something that um, we were just unable to do before. So the first thing though, um, to understand with parametric equations is a lot of times we don't make sense of them, right? So the first, you know, before I even solve this problem I gave to my students, I said, all right, well, you know, here's a, pair, here's a set of two parametric equations. What graph does this produce? And most students are like, no idea, right? They know now if they see x squared plus y squared equals four, they know that's a circle with the radius two, um, or x squared plus y squared equals r squared, they know that's a, a circle with the radius r, but that's not in this form. So one of the main skills that we want to accomplish in this section is learning how to go from parametric equations to a rectangular equations. And to do that, basically what we wanna do is eliminate the parameter, eliminate that third variable that the two parametric equations have in common. And again, that's typically going to be theta or t. So in this case, we have theta, and obviously if we wanna get rid of theta, what we need to do is we need to somehow represent how we can replace sine and cosine of theta. And to do that, we're gonna use this lovely parametric or <laughs> lovely identity that we've used multiple times, which is the Pythagorean identity. Cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. Now when we represent that, remember the trigonometric functions are squared, right? So this is cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta. So we can think about them like this. Now again, my goal is to eliminate the cosine of theta and the sine of theta. So to do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take both of these parametric equations and I'm gonna solve for sine of theta, cosine of theta. Then, now that I know what sine of theta and cosine of theta are equal to, I can now plug them into my equation and that's going to eliminate the theta, right? I can, re I can replace cosine of theta with x over four, I can replace sine of theta with y over four. And now what that allows me to do here, um, now what that allows me to do is to create this equation, x squared plus six, x squared over 16 plus y squared of 16 equals one. But again, that's not in the form I need it to be, right? So I wanna get rid of those 16 as the denominator. So I multiply everything by 16. That gives me x squared plus y squared equals 16, which now I can represent as a circle with a center of zero, zero and a radius of four, right? Just remember you square root the 16 to give you a radius of four. All right. Um, so that was that first kind of one. So basically what we're gonna do is just kind of practice doing the exact same thing, um, but then describe the shape of the equation. So in this next one, we're gonna do the same thing. I'm just gonna kind of set up here, um, cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta equals one. Okay, so for each of these problems, that's exactly what we're going to be doing. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just basically solve for y and x here to just kind of save myself some time. So y over two divided by three equals sine of theta and x minus three divided by three equals cosine of theta. Okay, so now that I've solved for sine of theta as well as cosine of theta, right? You can just see I just subtracted the two divided by three, subtracted the three divided by three. I'm just gonna plug them into the equation. So I have, you know, y minus two quantity squared plus x quantity three quantity squared equals one. All right, now in this case, remember when you have a rational expression um, squared, you're gonna wanna square the numerator as well as square the denominator. So in this case, I'll have y minus two quantity squared over nine plus x minus three quantity squared over nine equals one. Now, some students went ahead and expanded this, but again, I wanted to remind them, like when you go back to the definition here, we don't want it to be expanded of a circle. We wanna leave it in that binomial squared form because that tells us what the center is, h comma k. So, um, <clears throat> so I'll go back, no, nope, where is this thing? There she are. Okay, so now I wanna get rid of the nine off the denominator, so I'm just gonna multiply everything by nine here. I should put it right there. Then when I multiply everything by nine, what that does, 
The 9 divides out, so I'm left with y minus 2 quantity squared plus x minus 3 quantity squared equals 9. So now you can see that, again, this is a circle um, with a center at, again, now, again, the center is going to be your h comma k, right? So h is with x, k is with y. So that's going to be a center at 3 comma 2 and a radius of r equals 3, right? Because again, the radius is that 9 is going to equal r squared. So just make sure you have that um, written in there. All right, so the next one is, again, basically going to be doing the same process. I'm just going to switch up the colors here just to kind of make this a little bit, um, not to confuse everything. So again, in this case, um, I'm going to divide by 2, right? So no adding or subtracting. So I have I want to see the y here. So I have y divided by 2 equals the sine of theta. And in this case, I have x over 3 equals cosine of theta. Okay. Well, again, I have my sine and my cosine. So I'm just going to plug them in here. So in this case, I have y over 2 quantity squared plus x over 3 quantity squared equals 1. And therefore, that's going to give me a y squared over 4 plus a x squared over 9 equals 1. Now, this one becomes kind of interesting because, um, like, I can't, they don't have the same denominator. Now, again, if my goal is to kind of write this without any denominators, I can still figure out, like, what should I multiply them by? And the common denominator of 4 and 9 is going to be 36. So I'm going to multiply everything by 36. So 36 times y squared divided by 4 is going to leave me with a 9y squared plus a 4x squared equals 9. Now, one of the confusing things that students will do is they'll say, oh, it's a circle with the radius of 3. But again, we got to be careful. we got to understand or think about what is the 9 and the 4 actually doing to the graph. Well, they're stretching and compressing the graph, right? Because those are a dilation. That's how that's impacting the graph. It's not shifting it left or right, but that's going to be stretching or compressing it. So at least in this case, when we have the stretch and the, you know, in this case, when we're multiplying by 1 9th, it's happening to the y and the x value, right? And it's the exact same thing. Well, in this example, that's not happening. This one is being, you know, multiplied by the y variable, variable is being multiplied by 9, the x variable is being multiplied by 6. So what's happening is this circle is being distorted horizontally and vertically. So it's not a perfect circle anymore. And actually what I forgot to do, um, I am not going to go through the what took kind of this lesson a little bit longer is I had students in their graphing calculator change their function to uh, parametric mode, and we actually plug these equations into that, so therefore we could see. Now, again, you could just use the rectangular equation to understand um, what the shape of the curve is, and you'd see that this is a circle with a new center at 3, 2, but I also wanted students to kind of practice writing that in parametric mode. Well, in this case, we can see that this is going to be an ellipse. And we're going to study that more next chapter, so I just kind of left it at that. Um, I did want students to understand the center, though, which in this case would be 0, 0. So we'll, we'll discuss a little bit more as far as the horizontal or vertical ellipse, how this is going to um, work. But that's more for next chapter. So for right now, I just wanted them to understand, though, it's not a circle. It's an ellipse. All right, for the next example, um, again, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to solve for y or solve for sine of theta and cosine of theta. So I'll just add a 1 then divide by 3. Let's use, go back to red. All right, so now going to my red. So I have a y plus 1 over 3 equals sine of theta. And a x minus 2 divided by 4 equals cosine of theta. OK, so now again, plugging them in, I'll have a y plus 1 over 3 quantity squared plus x minus 2 over 4, quantity squared equals 1. You can square the numerator, square the denominator. So y plus 1, quantity squared over 9, plus x minus 2, quantity squared over 16, equals 1. All right. And um, dun, 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 dun. what was I trying to do? Oh, I don't remember. Okay, now let's go ahead and figure out. I was like, oh, what am I doing here? Um, now let's go and find the common denominator of 9 and 16. Um, these numbers, we're going to kind of be using the same numbers over and over again. So you'll get kind of used to this. The product of 9 and 16 is 144. Um, so if I multiply by 144, 
Nine goes into 144 16 times. And again, my students have a calculator for this chapter. So it's not anything I would not expect them that they could do without a calculator. And at least for right now, next chapter, they're not gonna have a calculator. So hopefully they'll be a little bit more familiar with it. But now again, we can see that um, this is the same kind of issue we had in the last example that they are being multiplied by different factors. So therefore it's not gonna produce a perfect circle, um, but it is again going to produce an ellipse in this case, my center now is going to be at two comma negative one. Oops, so an ellipse with a center at two comma negative one. So that is how you eliminate the parameter as well as understand the curve of the parametric equation, at least for trig. So then what we did is we said, all right, well, what about all the other types of functions? Like, what about this graph? You know, and I gave these to these students, like, what does that look? What does that look like? Most students had no idea. So one thing is we practice plugging them into a calculator and looking at what the graph looks like. And when doing that, you could see that, um, yeah, it produced a line. Now, the really the process for eliminating the parameter for any function is, or at least for these, these two functions that is not trig, is just to isolate t. Basically, you wanna solve for t. And the next thing is when you want to describe the graph though, we most, um, we most commonly understand graphs when it's y equals, right? When it's, you know, y equals x, that's a line. y equals x squared, that's a cube, that's a parabola. When it's y equals square root, that's a square root, right? So we understand when it's something y equals, and we spent time in functions dealing with 12 trigonometric, or 12, um, 12 different types of functions. So the important thing that we typically want to do most often is always solve for t in terms of the x equation. Therefore, once we solve for t in the x equation, we can plug what t is equal to into the y equation. So you can see I took both equations, I solve for t in the x equation, and I got this expression. Now it doesn't matter if you use the fraction or you, know, you factor out the one half, it doesn't really matter. But when I plug this into, in for t, t is equal to this, right? So going back to like systems of equations, solving by substitution, same process. You're you know, plugging in your variable into the other equation and then you're simplifying. And by simplifying, we get y equals negative two x minus three. And again, since that's equal to y equals, I know that is going to be a line. However, not everything is gonna be as easy as that first example. So for instance, if I try to solve for t and for x here, I'm gonna run into some problems, right? Because I have more than one t, what they're quadratic. Um, and so therefore that's gonna be an issue to be able to solve for t. So rather than actually spending any amount of time trying to like figure that out, I realized I could easily solve for y, which is t minus one or y plus one. If I plug y plus one in for t here, now I get this equation x equals y squared plus four y plus three, which again, is not something we are very familiar with at all, right? What is that equation? However, if you think about this, if you just swap these, right? If you just swap the variables x and y, you would get y equals x squared plus four x plus three. Now, most students know that is at least a parabola that opens up. And I would say, as long as you understand that's a parabola that opens up, you're good to go. You do have a calculator that could help you graph it. I actually understood that it was factorable. So I set it fact, so I factored it to find the zeros. And then I did a little bit more detailed sketch. However, that's not always going to be the case. So you don't want to rely on that method, but it should be something that you recognize and say, okay, I see what you're doing there. Now, this actually brings us back again to our functions unit. So here's this equation. I know what this graph looks like. That's a parabola that opens up. So if I swap the variables, the x and y, what is that doing? Well, that's like me finding the invert, or that's like me finding the inverse of the function, right? That's reflecting it about the y equals x line. So if I swap the variables, right, now it's going to be a side, now it's gonna be a parabola that opens up to the right. So um, as far as describing the graph, you know, it's just basically the same thing. It's this sideways parabola. Um, you know, it opens to the right. And again, we're going to investigate this further, but I just want to make students understand that what the curve is and typically what the opening is going to be. So those are two examples I went with my students, and then I gave them these problems to go ahead and work on and present on the board. So let's just go ahead and practice again um, a couple more. Okay, so onto the first example. Um, again, I'm just gonna do the same thing um, that I kind of did in the first example. I'm just gonna solve for t in the x equation. So I'm just gonna write that equation here. So 2t minus four, and then I'll just solve for t. So I have x plus four equals 2t divided by two. And therefore you can say x plus four divided by two equals t. Now I'm gonna keep the same, um, same expression here, and I'm just gonna plug that in directly um, into my other equation for y. 
So therefore I have y equals 1 half times x plus 4 divided by 2 plus 1. Now again, you can see here that's going to produce a 1 fourth times x plus 4 plus 1. Now again, you could simplify this, right? If you distribute this, so it'd be y equals um, 1 fourth x plus 1 plus 1. But again, you don't need to. I mean, I guess it really depends on the question. But either way, you can see that this is again going to produce a line, right? And where the y-intercept would be two, the slope is one-fourth, just it kind of depends on what types of information you're asked. Um, it has a positive slope, you know, for instance. Now the next one, a lot of students sometimes, again, get confused with the fractions. They say, ah, I hate fractions. But again, we don't want to solve for y. So we're kind of forced <laughs> to focus on solving for t in this equation. Well, again, like if I want to get rid of like what's happening here, again, this is the same thing as t divided by three, right? You're trying to solve for t. So if t is being divided by three, just multiply by three. Undo division by multiplication. So I have three x is equal to t. Or, you know, you can think about just multiplying by three over one, that's multiplying by the reciprocal on both sides. Either way, t is equal to three x. Now I'll just plug in y equals a three x. Um, quantity squared plus 2 times 3x is go ahead and just simplify from here. So y is going to equal a 9x squared plus 6x. Hopefully you can see that this is going to be a parabola. And that's going to open up. I didn't tell you need to describe, but I think it's just important for you to know that the parabola is going to open up in that case. All right, um, the next couple examples here is, now we have another one. Um, I think solving for x here is rather simple. So we have x minus one. So just add a one to the other side. So we have x plus one equals t. And then we're just going to apply that into the other function. Now here we have two t's, right? So we need to make sure that we apply x plus one into both of them. And then just with a little bit of simplifying, this is x plus one over x plus two. Okay, um, now again, this is just going to be a, uh, just a rational function. I'm not really sure um, what the curve, um, how you'd actually express this. Um, but you know, you should just understand that that is going to produce a rational equation or rational function. Um, really the main thing, you know, just kind of know that also you should remind, remember that they have vertical asymptotes at negative two, a horizontal asymptote at one. Not like I'm going to ask you, I'm just a good, it's just a good refresh to kind of know what the curve or what this graph is going to look like. Um, all right, the next one is, again, it looks like it's going to be much more difficult to solve for x or than it is for y, but in reality, all you have to do to get rid of the cube roots is just a cube both sides, right? If x equals the cube root of t, I'm going to want to cube, just cube both sides. So x cubed equals t. So now when I plug that in, I get y equals 1 minus x cubed. Now a lot of students are like, I have no idea what that is. And again, I just reminded them, like, just rearrange the, very, like, rearrange the terms. This is x cubed plus 1, right? Hopefully you should recognize that this is a cubic function, right? It's a cubic curve. It's a little s curve that we called it. Um, and again, just remind, remembering the transformations, that's a reflection um, about the x-axis with a vertical shift up one. So you didn't have to go through the reflections, but I just kind of use this as a teaching um, tool to remind students of our transformations as well as asymptotes. All right, for the next two examples though, or at least for this next example, again, we realize that solving for x here is not really going to be ideal right? And we haven't really talked about that in this class. So therefore, um, that was kind of my point for the students to understand is, oh, this is supposed to be a negative. Um, the point that I was trying to bring to the students was that, yeah, this is, um, this is something that we're not very familiar with as far as solving for the absolute value. Now, again, hopefully in Algebra 2, you remember how to solve for the absolute value. Um, but again, we we can, rather than even like spending any ounce of energy trying to figure this out at this moment, since it's not something we discussed in the class, I'm going to go ahead and solve for y. So when I solve for y here, I get uh, y equals 3t. I'll divide by 3, and I get t equals, you know, one third, or y over 3, which t equals one third y. Again, you can really use any representation you want to, uh, but I'm going to represent it. I'm going to use the one third y because I think that's a little bit easier to like recognize. And then I have x equals a negative absolute value of one minus one third y. 
okay? Now again, what is that graph going to produce? Well, let's again step back here and say, all right, what would y equals negative absolute value of one minus one third x produce? And again, you know what? Forget about all the stuff in the inside. Like that's a lot that looks very, very confusing. As far as the transformations, it is pretty confusing. But what would just y equals negative absolute value of x look like? Like what would that graph look like? And because all what's happening on the inside, remember, that's just going to be shifting the graph left or right, right? So if we just think of y equals negative x, and that's kind of confusing. That would take a little bit more work, a little bit more explanation. But if we just kind of focus on y equals negative x, we know the graph is going to open down, right? And it's going to be what we call that V-shaped graph. So if I have the x and the y flipped again, um, basically what's happening now is now if my graph is going to be reflected about the y equals x line, what's going to happen is we're going to have this graph is now going to be open to the left. So I'm just going to call this a V-shaped graph or the absolute value. And that's going to open to the left. Okay, and again, you could do that with the same thing with the parabola. When the parabola opens down, if you're reflecting that about the y equals x line, instead of it opening down, it's now going to reflect to the, it's gonna to open to the left. So when it's positive, it opens to the right. When it's negative, it opens up to the left. And the next example is another one um, where it looks a lot easier to solve for y and then for x. But the problem is when we solve for y, if you were to plug in this y into this equation, you're only gonna get the square root, right? So therefore, you're gonna think like, that's only gonna give you x equals the square root curve. Um, and But remember, that's when x is equal to. So if you reflect, it's only gonna give you part of the graph. So in this one, it's gonna be really important for us to be able to solve for y, and I'll, you'll see in a second. So this one, I know it takes a little bit more work, right, and that's fine, but we're just gonna go ahead and solve here. So I have x minus two, equals the square root of 3t. Then I'm gonna get rid of the square root by squaring both sides. Then I'll divide by three, right? So I have this big equation here, x minus two quantity squared over three, right? That equals t. Now, once I plug that into my y equation, I have y equals negative three times x minus two quantity squared over three. Well. The negative, the negative three and the three divide out to give me a negative x minus two quantity squared. And again, now I can see that this is a parabola that opens down. Okay, and hopefully you recognize also has a shift two units to the right and the graph should look something like that. If you were to plug y into the x, you would not get a parabola. You would get the square root curve. And if you reflected the square root curve about the y equals x line, kind of like doing that same thinking we've done before, you would only get half of the parabola. So that's why it's very important to try to always solve for x. Um, think about the two times, at least in this class, where we're going to avoid solving for x would be the absolute value curve and when it's a quadratic. You know, if this, like for instance, the two examples that I did not solve for x, um, where I solve for y was the absolute value and the quadratic. And obviously there's more examples, but for this class, that's what I'd say you could focus on. Or at least understanding otherwise, to understand the graph perfect best would be to solve for t, sorry, solve for t in the x equation. And the other thing too, I just reminded students and remind you as well that, you know, you can use your calculator to understand what the graph is going to look like. All right, um, last example, guys, is just um, the particle motion. So therefore, I just kind of went over with students the understanding the path of an object um, modeled in feet per second using parametric equations, x equals v sub zero times cosine of theta t, and y equals negative 16 t is zero plus v sub zero sine of theta t plus y sub zero, where basically v sub zero represents our initial velocity and y sub zero represents our initial height. So these are gonna be very famous problems, like if you throw a ball, right, from ground level, or maybe sometimes you're gonna be like on top of a cliff and you throw a ball, okay? So when we want to represent the vertical um, height as well as the horizontal height in terms of time, we're gonna to wanna to use these parametric equations. And again, basically what will be given is usually like an angle that something is shot or thrown from as well as its velocity. So. 
uh, the first example that I did with my students was we just kind of covered, you know, an arrow is shot from the ground at an angle of 76 degrees with an initial velocity of 300 feet per second. Write the parametric equations that model the path of the arrow. So basically we have 300 feet per second. That's going to be my initial velocity. Since it's being shot from the ground, my y sub zero is equal to zero. Okay. So my initial velocity is 300 feet per second and my initial height is going to be zero. And then my theta is going to be 76 degrees. So having those two equations, I just plug in the information and I get my two parametric equations right here. Now the next one was how do you find the height and the horizontal distance when the arrow is at three seconds? And the nice thing is that's what these two parametric equations represent. This parametric equation or this equation here um, function really represents the horizontal distance based on the time. This represents the vertical distance based on the time. So all I had to do was just plug in three. And again, I had to use my calculator to go ahead and plug that in. And therefore you can see I got 217 feet. Um, and then when I plugged in three in for the Y equation, I got 729 feet. So just by setting up the equations and then plugging them in, you can see how we arrived at the feet. Now, the one thing I tried to keep this a little bit sim um, easier with the students is because I don't require my students to have a graphing calculator for the test. So the, some of the problems that are a little bit more advanced, that would be a little bit multi-step, um, I didn't kind of cover just because, or I kind of covered in class as just like an extension of this lesson, but I didn't want to focus this lesson on there because therefore it's not gonna show up on the test um, because not all my students have graphing calculators or at least access to them. So the next example um, is one where I actually gave you the parametric equation. So rather than giving you the information, I gave you the parametric equations. And this one says a ball is shot out of a cannon um, and represented using the following parametric equations where T is in seconds and distance in feet. So what is the maximum height of the ball? Now, again, you got to understand here that when we're looking into this parametric equation, I forgot to type this in. We're looking in this parametric equation. Um, I can't believe I forgot to do that. So let's see if I can remember everything. So go back to function mode. So when we want to find the maximum height for the ball, we're looking for the X value. Now we could find the X value in terms of time, right? But one of the things we, since we're not dealing with time, we're only dealing with like the height, right? Um, so a lot of times what's going to be best to do is eliminate the parameter in this case. Now I did a problem that was fairly simple to eliminate the parameter with because T is equal to X. But what I'm going to want to type in my equation here, or at least in my calculator is negative one sixteenth X squared plus 30 X plus hundred. Okay. So what that equation is, since T is equal to X, that's going to be the um, horizontal distance in, or the vertical distance in terms of the horizontal distance. So um, otherwise, sometimes what I'll do is I will just eliminate the parameter and go ahead and plug it in that way. You know, whatever you're, sometimes you have to do a little bit more math to eliminate the parameter um, and then plug them in. But again, since I'm not asking at none of these questions or referring to time, it's not really going to be necessary for me to use the parametric equations like I did in the last example. So now the one thing I wanted to do with the students is a lot of students are not familiar, at least my students are not familiar with using graphing technology. So we spent a lot of time in class um, helping students get these graphs um, out, kind of talking about the window um, that we used. In this case, I use um, Y min is zero. I think the Y max I used 4,000. No, Y max was 500, I believe. And then the Y min was zero. Cause again, it didn't make sense for my X and my Y to be negative. So I just use zero. And then the Y max I think was 5,000. Um, and you can change your scale and all that kind of stuff. But the main point that I wanted students to do is when they go ahead and graph this, they should get the path of a ball looking something like this. Now, so the first thing we want to do is find the maximum height of the ball. Well, that's going to be the Y coordinates <clears throat> of this graph. And the reason why, again, I put this in terms of Y and X, because the question is saying, you know, what is the height, right? And what is the distance that the ball travels or how far is the ball travel before it hits the ground? So that is going to be the X value, like how far it travels to this X value. So 
in this case, I want to find the y value. In this case, I want to find the x value. So to find the y value, what I'm going to do is find the max. And again, so to do that, I'm not going to spend too much time because I'm not taking this as a um, technology lesson. But you just go ahead and use second calculus, at least for a um, TI calculator. And to find the maximum, you do the left bound and the right bounds. You could also use the formula for the vertex of a parabola. It'd be a little bit more difficult um, with these numbers, but you could definitely do it. And I get a maximum height of y equals 3,700, okay? And that's, again, just be using graphing technology. Um, now, if I wanted to find where the ball hits, well, then what I'm looking for is, again, I'm going to be looking for the x value. So now I'm going to be looking for the zero of the um, graph. So I'm looking for basically when does the graph cross the uh, x x axis. So I'm just going to, again, do left bounds. Then I'll do a right bounds, and x equals 483.31. And again, these are in feet. Okay? And the last one says, is there, you know, if there is a wall 200 feet away that is 3,000 feet high, um, will the ball clear that wall? So again, like you got to think that's 200 feet. So, you know, 400, halfway around would be, you know, roughly 200 right, or a little bit, a um, little bit more. So let's pretend, you know, here's what they're basically asking. So here's the graph. We have something that's 200 feet, right, away. And basically what we want to know is this y value going to clear 3,000 feet, right? So basically we want to know what is the y value at 200. So I'm just going to take this equation. So I'm just going to have my equation here. And, nope. And now I'm just going to evaluate it in for 200. So by taking the graph, I can basically just go ahead and type in 200. Hmm, and I forgot. There you go, value. There you go, x value of 200. So when I type in second calculate, again, I go to value and I type in 200 and I get 3,600. So I can say at, 200 feet, the ball will be 3,600 feet high. So therefore, it will clear the fence. So another problem that we like to typically do is use time in this case, like at a certain time, will it clear the fence? But therefore, you'd have to do a little bit more math um, for there, but I just wanted to kind of keep things simple, um, introducing students to, again, another word problem as well as solving. But there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Um, that is basically our lesson for parametric equations. Um, I hope you understood some things from this lesson as far as, you know, what are parametric equations, how to eliminate the parameter, as well as how to use them for word problems. But if you did have any questions or anything that was kind of hard to understand, please feel free to comment down below, and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Cheers.